Welcome again. We're in our new series. We've been looking at how the Lord is calling us to be a supernatural community that's all about Jesus. And we've been looking in the book of Acts and in chapter 2 verse 43 it says here, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Other translations of this verse would say something like, a deep sense of awe came over them all and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Or another translation says, awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Other translations of this verse say, a deep sense of awe came over them all and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. That's the New Living Translation. Or how about this one? Awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. That's the ESV, the English Standard Version. A more literal translation, my own translation, would be Awe kept on coming on them all and many signs and wonders kept on coming. That talks about the tenses there that are in the verbs. The Greek word there is teras and it means marvel, something marvellous, something miraculous happens here on the earth and it points to the realities of heaven. Now we say the phrase wonders never cease, but when we look at the church now, maybe we should ask why did wonders ever cease? Why was what was so common then in that church, we read about here, so uncommon now in our churches in the Western world. And another word, we hear that word awe used a lot these days as part often of a much overused word, awesome. How often do we say things are awesome when really they're not particularly awesome? The early church was a supernatural community that was all about Jesus and that is what made it truly awesome. Some other translations again use the word fear instead of or because the word there is phobos from which we get phobia and if you've ever actually felt real awe in the presence of God you'll know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and that fear is closely linked to awe the presence of God when the Holy Spirit is manifest is awesome it's kind of fearsome I'd been in ministry full-time about 10 years when I was part of helping found what became a big summer conference. I was the associate minister in the church and the guy who led it was really well connected. So we had access to various great speakers who came from all around the world. And we tried to make it so that those who were on the main stage also went and spoke to the youth. But if anybody backed out or if, to be honest, if anything uh, happened really, when somebody couldn't do it, I was the backup guy. I'd go and fill any gaps in any programs, especially in the speaking program. And one year, a speaker that many of you would probably have heard of said his days of speaking to youth were well, well behind him. No, thank you, we don't want to go and do that. So I got sent over to this tent in the middle of a field, a substitute. And I found there about 70 to 100 young people looking seriously bored and unimpressed. And they had a few leaders who were just trying to desperately stop them leaving to go and run about and mess about outside. What did we do? Well, we sang a song or two. When I say we, I mean me and the leaders mostly. And then somebody who was a mime artist, I seem to remember, got up and did a pretty terrible sketch with an invisible dog for some reason, set to music that kept on skipping. And then it was me. And I, I didn't want to be there any more really than they did. I thought maybe the best thing we could do was get through this, wrap it up as soon as possible. In the back of my head, I'm thinking then I'll be able to go and listen in the main arena to the big name guy who had landed me in this position in the first place. Now, I can't remember much of what I said. I doubt anybody else would remember any of it, but I told my story of how I'd given my life to Jesus Christ as a young police officer, uh, how I was investigating the Bible for myself and looking for evidence for his existence, his death and resurrection, and how he'd met me physically, powerfully, when his presence invaded the car I was driving on the way to work. I'll never forget it. That was the moment everything changed, when Jesus walked off the pages of the Bible into my life. But really, nobody seemed interested in the story. I was ready to give everybody, myself included, the words of merciful release so they could all go. And finally, I thought, you know what, I better pray for everybody. And I realised at that point that was something I'd not really done at any point till then. All I was doing was running the programme. I was just getting on with the plan. So I closed my eyes and then I felt like these words came. We've seen 
what you can do do you want to see what i can do those words came before i started to pray and they were unmistakably clear they were kind of words on the inside of me they sounded like my voice but i knew it wasn't my thoughts as i began to pray the holy spirit spoke unmistakably yes please that's all i said i didn't I didn't say anything else i wanted god to come and do what only he could do and suddenly the power and the presence of the lord came in like a cloud just heavy it said in the old testament there were times when the glory of the lord came in and people prophesied or or the ministers couldn't do anything and that was the kind of glorious presence that came in to that tent in kent in a field and I didn't say a word, I didn't look at anybody, I just knew I'd better get on my knees. I kind of wanted to hide, I sort of curled up into a ball on my knees. I didn't want to speak, I didn't really even want to breathe. I I didn't want to be noticed, I wanted to hide if I could. Because God was here, now, in this tent. And and I don't, the, the awe, yeah, I knew the fear, the sense that he is holy, holy holy awesome and we've been in this series looking at the early church as she first started when the holy spirit came to a group of christians they've been waiting for the promise of jesus to be fulfilled as they prayed it happened people from all over the roman empire were there in the city to celebrate the feast of pentecost and they saw and they heard and they felt something and they didn't just say oh isn't god nice and isn't isn't you know worship lovely no they felt his presence they saw his power they knew his holiness had come up close too close for comfort so they cried out what what must we do to be saved and thousands believed on day one and they were all baptized in the name of jesus In the weeks and months that followed, this group grew exponentially in the city of Jerusalem. Before long, we we tracked the movement of this group of ordinary people touched by the fire of God and passion for Jesus. They were burning with love for him and one another as they formed around the word and worship and when they met with one another. And the wonders that got started never ceased. Supernatural community was happening whenever, wherever they met and people were being set free and miracles were happening and and they were all about Jesus whether in small gatherings they'd call the ecos which would involve friends and family and neighbours if you've ever been on holiday to places like Spain or Greece maybe you'll know what it's like in the evening you'll see people meeting outside houses eating playing talking together the kids and all the generations mixing up together that's an ecos picture or where and when they could, when persecution didn't prevent it, they gathered in larger groups as the ecclesia. Ecclesia. Where's that word from? Well, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus, the carpenter of Nazareth, went to a place called Caesarea Philippi. He went with his disciples and he was going to give the blueprint to them of what he was going to build, what he'd come to leave behind to do his work on the earth. And he didn't say, I will build my temple. He didn't say, I will build my synagogue. Those were the two most prominent Jewish holy institutions at the time. But Jesus, the builder, didn't talk about building a building. He chose a word everybody would have recognised as a secular entity. First developed centuries beforehand by the Greeks when he said, I will build my ecclesia. That's literally what he said. In the Old Testament, that word, the Hebrew is kahal, was used to describe any public gathering in Israel, a crowd. The, the millions of people of God, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, they were called the kahal. So it was translated as the congregation in the desert in some translations. Congregation then had nothing to do with church. The word just meant a large group getting together, a movement of people, God's people. By Jesus' time, the word ecclesia was never used of a religious meeting. Everybody who heard that word knew it was a governmental, socio-political institution. A group of citizens that a king or Caesar would select, pull together to represent him, he would delegate authority to them so they could make a change and make a difference in his kingdom, in his name. So, When the Apostle Paul and other church leaders began to talk about themselves as church, the ecclesia that is in Rome or in Corinth or wherever, they were making a powerful countercultural statement. They were coming together wherever they were to be all about Jesus. They were brought together as his citizens wherever they were. He was the king, we're his subjects to whom we give first and full allegiance. 
We are King Jesus' ecclesia in the world, but of the kingdom of heaven. The job of any ecclesia, you see, was to make that place where they were just like the kingdom that their king came from. The Romans built those aqueducts and baths and roads all across Britain. And that fort, you can go and visit in Castlefield in Mamukium, because an ecclesia got together to make it happen. Imagine something like HS2, but it actually happening. <laughs> you'd, you'd come to Bath, you'd come to Manchester, you look at those places and think, oh, somebody built this to be just like Rome. So, after Peter finally saw who Jesus really is, he said, he voiced it, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord says to all his disciples, on this truth, that revelation, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The ecclesia is going to come smashing through. In other words, when we live like Jesus is who he says he is, nothing on earth can stop his kingdom. Heaven will come to earth where his ecclesia work together in unity on it. It's like being awarded the keys to the city. He then says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom to unlock heaven, to bind up the strong man, the schemes of hell, when you come together in my name as my people to do my will. He, the king, has delegated authority to his ecclesia. It was a familiar concept everywhere in the empire. Wherever a group of citizens, even two or three, came together in the name of Caesar, Rome was there. It was as if Caesar was there. There was power there, authority to legislate. Now, we need to realise that though our translations now use the word church for what he said, and we have that preloaded and overladen with 2,000 years of tradition, religion, robes and religious rigmarole, ecclesia, when Jesus spoke of it, is a world away from a building that religious people go into. When it first got started here, nobody went to church. People went as ecclesia. We can, of course, use buildings, but he wasn't talking about buildings at all. The church the world stood in awe, or was awe of was all about the word and worship and one another. And they saw wonders as they were built together as living stones. Individuals, citizens of the heavenly kingdom, operating 24-7, imagine this, as a transformative organism not as an ecclesiastical organisation. In his commentary on the book of Acts, F.F. F. Bruce wrote a story that when St. Thomas Aquinas, centuries later, met Pope Innocent II, he found him surrounded by treasures, counting out a large sum of money. And the Pope smiled and he said, the church can no longer say, silver and gold have I none. True, Holy Father, Thomas replied, but neither can she now say, rise up and walk. Why did wonders ever cease? It has a lot to do with our theology, how we see God, but it also has a lot to do with our ecclesiology, how we present him to the world. What is the church of King Jesus? Over the centuries, that powerful, vibrant, authoritative word ecclesia got changed into the one we get, this weak, wet, religious words like ecclesiastical come from. The word Church came much later, either from a German word that's close to the Scottish word Kirk, which meant belonging to God. So, of course, that could be used of buildings, and that's what it became. Or possibly its roots are in a Latin word that meant circus. Either way, it gets what Jesus is building very wrong, and it's not the church Jesus is using, the word that Jesus is using in the New Testament when he describes this gathering of God's people. We're not meant to be just a building, we're not meant to be a circus. We're here to be an ecclesia. That word is used 112 times and it never meant people coming together inside to hide from the world. It meant God's people get together to go and change the world. So we're not technically speaking Ivy Church, we are Ivy Ecclesia now. We are a supernatural community that's all about Jesus. So we devote ourselves to the word and worship and one another. Next week, we're going to see how as part of that supernatural community, that also changes how we use our wealth, how we handle the resources the king has entrusted us to do his work and his will. I love that. I'm excited by that. But it's still not awesome enough. There's still something missing. When I put that against this church in the book of Acts, on my sabbatical, I was meeting in that ecos kind of way, eating breakfast with a friend of mine who leads a church in Warrington. We started talking about being Jesus' ecclesia and my friend Mike asked me, 
What's your expectation to see the miraculous signs and wonders at Ivy? Mm. Now we have this sign hanging on the cross here. I've done for years because Jesus died and rose again. That's the greatest miracle. So sinners like you and me could be forgiven and brought into God's forever family as his sons and daughters. And that's the next greatest miracle, our salvation. So if he can do that, what else can he do? Because that same Jesus also broke the so-called laws of nature on the land and sea and through storms because he made the laws and his grace overcame those laws. He multiplied resources to meet the needs of thousands. He made the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers were made whole, the demonized were set free, the sick were healed, the dead were raised by Jesus and his disciples. And then he said, I'm going to go to the Father, but I won't leave you as orphans. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to come and be with you. And guess what? It's better for you that I go. So he will come and when you go, you're going to do greater things than I do because I am going to the Father. Who's going to do those things? You. You will do greater things than Jesus. That's what he wants because that's what he said because he has made the same power that he operated in available to every one of those who are his sons and daughters who God's sons and daughters part of his ecclesia right now he doesn't just tell us to do it he's put into our hands all we need to see the kingdom come on the earth so Mike looked at me with that coffee in his hand and he's thinking about the ecclesia that he leads for Jesus now too and we're discussing, you know, what's our real expectation of miracles and signs and wonders whenever, wherever we meet in his name? And I've just been telling him that we do have this thing that we believe is from God, we call it the discipleship pathway. Do the course if you've not done it yet, if you really want to be connected in with us as Ivy. And as part of that we talk about devoting ourselves like the early church did in Acts, to the word and worship of one another. And then I said, oh wow, of course. And there were wonders. The early church prayed, and when they prayed, it worked wonders. Rather, God worked wonders when they prayed. And there it is, that next verse, it's right here. That's why everyone was in awe of the church. Not because they were devoted to the word, not because the worship was great, not because they just love one another. Although those things are important, they can all become insular and self-focused and actually be safely ignored by the outside world. But when you don't just have people going to church, when the Holy Spirit is moving in close, close ecos relationships and powerfully commissioned ecclesia, that's a supernatural community. And if it's all about Jesus, you're going to see the wonders that he said will follow his word and if we pray like we believe our God is big enough if our God is alive and well if his word is still true do you believe that if our worship connects earth with heaven if we are united and love one another we should expect that wonders will never cease that should be our expectation really expect a miracle I mean what else are we doing here why are we gathering what, what do we think is going to happen when we're here? A lady called Annie Dillard wrote this. On the whole, I do not find Christians sens sufficiently sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or, as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are like children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear lady straw hats and velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may wake someday and take offence, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. So in that tent, when I finally, I don't know how long I was on the floor, but... It was silent for the longest time, apart from the occasional sound of somebody somewhere weeping. It took a long time before I could even stand up because the presence of God was so thick and heavy. But when I stood up, I looked around, nobody else was standing up. We'd seen what I could do and God said, will you let me show you what I can do? And what he did was that, well, everybody who was already a Christian there knew we had met 
met with the reality of God right there, tangibly and fully. And a, a whole group of unbelieving youth, somebody had dragged along in a bus from a local estate, every single one of them had an encounter that evening with the Lord. And they all gave their lives to him. And that started that church's youth group. Many years later, I met with the leader who brought them that night. He said, all of them were still going strong in the Lord. You know, that just makes me want to pray, oh Lord, would you rouse us and revive us and shake us and wake us up to the power of the God we sing about and we say we're meeting with, to the supernatural realities of our world and our warfare and oh, that wonders would never cease. It, you see, it's not stopped everywhere, but wonders seem to have pretty much ceased in the Western church, haven't they, as we look at it. And that's not because our God isn't there. It's not because he's lost any of his power. It isn't because our God doesn't care. It's not just because of our reliance upon science to explain what is true either. Humble scientists would acknowledge we don't know everything. We're going to always keep on learning and trying to make sense of these grand cosmic realities. It's not because there was a move in early 20th century theology that was called cessationism that said the miracles that we see here, Jesus doing and then the apostles continuing, it is their norm throughout the book of Acts, stopped about halfway through Acts and it stopped when the Bible was completed. You know, these theologians, so-called, said we don't need miracles and signs anymore. We just need to study the word, try and do our, our best to do what it says. And apart from those Parts, of course, for example, where Jesus told his disciples to go into the world and drive out demons or heal the sick and so on. They'll just say, well, that was then. This is now. We just have the word. No wonder wonders ceased. There was a place, actually, Jesus went to where it says even he couldn't do many, many miracles. Do you know why? Do you know what he wondered at? Their lack of faith. Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done for you. If you have faith that there will be no miracles, guess what? Wonders will cease. But as I look back, as I look in the Word, I've seen too much to believe that that is true. What I've seen and what I want to see more and more as the world seems to me to be crying out for an ecclesia that will come in his power and smash down the gates of hell to set people free. In the name of King Jesus, I'm just so sorry for the times and the years when I've let hell close those gates on me. And I've settled for doubt and, and for a church that misses out on being ecclesia. When I first started in full-time ministry, Zoe and I came into a church in Devon that was experiencing the incredible move of the Holy Spirit. The church was packed, the town was full of people wanting to come and find out more. Everybody was in awe because supernatural was our normal. Incredible dreams, prophetic words from the youngest to the oldest in the services, just as was promised at Pentecost when it first got started. We were the same kind of church. The wonders there never ceased. I saw a lady who was registered blind and in a wheelchair step, healed in a meeting. She heard audibly a man's voice telling her to stand and walk and she turned to a friend and a friend said nobody was there but she said I heard a voice and then she did what the voice said a few steps walking on her ankles at first and then she asked for a bible like the voice told her to do next and the first thing that she'd seen in decades as she opened the bible she could see and the verse that she opened to was this one from Luke chapter 4 verse 40 they brought those with all manner of diseases to Jesus and he healed them that same week she walked in, she gave the wheelchair back to the GP and she had to have her whole house reconverted because she was no longer disabled. Over the years since then, I've prayed. I've seen many answers that I would describe as miracles. Yes, sometimes I've been disappointed, sometimes really hard. It is warfare, it's a battle, but we must never give up. Back in those days in Devon, I read a vineyard pastor called Rich Nathan say, you have to swing the bat. He was, he was an American, so he was talking about baseball, but it works for cricket too, of course, for us, those of us who are English. You connect the problem to God in prayer and maybe pff, you hit a six. You create that opportunity for a miracle when we pray in faith. If you never swing the bat, I suppose you might feel like you'll be less likely to be disappointed. But actually what we've really done is just set the bar so low. We've made a little teeny tiny God so far removed from the God of Scripture and how disappointing is that? 
So we do want to pray for people today. Wherever we meet, in whatever way we're meeting, we want to pray for people with faith. We want to swing the bat because we want the supernatural so wonders will never cease.